The 17th Annual Cinema Touching Disability Film Festival presents CTDFF Online Filmmaker Q&A with Galen Lee, Galen Lee, The Songs We Sing, Jeff M. Giordano, and Aaron Gwynn, Charles Curtis Blackwell. So I'm Dennis Morell, and to uh, describe myself, I to describe myself, I'm an Anglo man. Um, I'm pretty gray. In fact, I'm real gray. Gray hair, gray beard. I'm hanging out in my back porch. You know, uh, we at CTD, we that's who we are, the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. We went to work at home uh, in early March, and we've all been working at home pretty much since then. And uh, that's the way of the world these days. Um, so, in our in our little discussion before we started coming on, you know, Galen said, "Well, are you sitting in this Center for Independent Living?" I thought it might be interesting for those of you who aren't familiar with this to know what it is we're doing. And uh, we are not a Center for Independent Living, which is a federally described uh, support nonprofit locally helping people to live independently in a community. Very important. We have many, many friends in the Center for Independent Living and represent them uh, in the state legislature and state agencies. We are an advocacy organization and we try to work with public policy to make the world a little better place for people with disabilities. It's work almost all in Texas. We do a little federal stuff. We also, um, you know, we do have communications throughout the state and we do a consumer directed services agency. Some of you may be familiar with that. We also do arts programming. And uh, a question I will ask of our filmmaker and star friends later is arts advocacy. So that'll be something you all can think about and how you're gonna answer that question when it, when it comes. We have, actually have been around since 1978. 42 years is pretty old for a disability rights organization. And it's uh, in fact predates the ADA by a significant number of years. I tend to think that that's a failure of American society to have passed the ADA much earlier when it should have been done rather than us being so much ahead of the curve. So the film festival, believe it or not, this is our 17th year. And as you know, William had remarked earlier, this is our first time to do an online version We've always done an in-theater version. We had Tilly Jones from Australia a few years back came in and who was the star of her own film and, and is a fabulous musician too, who not only played music, but uh, her film was shown, answered questions. And uh, I think she was like 16 at the time, <laughs> you know, which made me feel like I'd wasted my entire life. I think we all felt that way, uh, but this is our, our first year doing an online version, and we actually, it's not in as a response to the pandemic. We had always planned to do this, and the lessons we've learned from doing this, I think, are going to inform us going forward. In fact, our October in-theater event, we've just uh, decided this week to take that to a virtual event, which will not be online, where you can watch all the time, but it'll be sort of real time in, in three evenings in October. We'll miss the theater event, we'll miss seeing people and doing the interactive events we have in the wraparound events, but uh, this is the world we're in now and we are gonna make the best of it. So we have um, filmmakers and films tonight. And so, I, so what we're gonna do is we're going to start with our first film, an incredible film called Galen Lee, The Songs We Sing, and then have a discussion with Galen Lee herself afterwards. Following Galen Lee, the songs we sing. No, uh, what didn't a, make it though. The filmmaker did. She's not here sadly. Well, you're gonna you're gonna get all the glory of this, Galen. I mean, <laughs> what a, uh, you know, I mean, it was a beautifully made film. And yeah. obviously the subject is beautiful, but the pacing of it, the communication that occurs is is it's, it's very very well done yeah he's really really awesome and it was nerve-wracking to be like oh do we want a guy in our van for two weeks with us and he was so nice and easy to work with that it was like i wish he was here all the time he's just so cool so so he traveled he was, with you yeah he mark is really neat and sad he couldn't be here yeah that's all the van footage just because he he went with us on a 10-day tour. He had to fly home 
right before I spoke at the State Department. So he couldn't stay for that because he had a work engagement. Um, but he was really cool to be as engaged as he was. He went out for 11 shows, I think, or something like that. So, yeah, he was with us for a while. And you said he spoke at the State Department? Yeah, right after that. He was so disappointed. He's a he's the photographer for a university, and it was graduation, so he can't be like, bye, I'm not coming to that. So um, he had to be there, but he would have come with us, obviously, if he could have, but it didn't work. And, and may I ask, what was the subject of your talk at the State Department? Um, kind of the same as a lot of places, you know, accessibility, not just in the arts, but in, in like a broader sense of where we're at you know, now we're 30 years into the ADA, um, just kind of general, like, yeah, accessibility in the arts and also where disability rights is headed, hopefully, um, changing a little bit of a narrative of disability in our culture overall. I had left you with a question before we showed your film, is arts advocacy, because as an advocacy organization, we have the, our arts efforts and, and in film and in creative writing and even in live open mics that Susie and Laura do. So my guess is the answer, when I pose you that question, I think I know what your answer can be. I'm gonna go ahead and pose you that question and let you yeah. riff on it. Is arts advocacy? You know, I think it, I think it depends on how you take it or it, like, for me, I don't necessarily feel the music I write has to relate 100% to my disability. Um, so in that way, I would say, I don't know, you know, it depends on what you take from my live show. Obviously, I look different. I play differently. I think it makes you question your assumptions about disability, but that's not the point of my show. Where advocacy and art come in for me, and what's kind of funny is when Mark made this documentary, we had just been touring for about a year and a half. And so probably six months after that, I made a decision not to play at any venues that weren't wheelchair accessible. And if they didn't have a ramp on the stage, um, that I would just play on the floor because I was not, I was going back to these venues, you know, multiple years in a row at this point, and they just weren't making any progress, even though they'd be like, oh yeah, we should really have a ramp and they wouldn't do it. And so now I was, I mean, it's, this, this documentary came in earlier in my career, but uh, not long after that, I was like, you know, I, nothing's going to change if I don't say that I refuse to do it anymore, like I refuse to engage with it. And so I started um, changing how I do things. And that is advocacy for sure. And so where I think artists have a lot of power besides the messaging of their work is how they conduct themselves in business. And I would like to see non-disabled artists refuse to play at inaccessible venues too. I don't think it just has to be me making that call. Um, I like that you guys are doing accessible film festivals by doing them online um, and making sure there's captioning and stuff because if we don't start just demanding it, um, the change isn't gonna happen, I don't think, um, until more people just start saying, this is, this is the new normal. <laughs> like, this is what we're gonna just do. Um, so that, that has been for sure, big, big time. Um, changed my advocacy. Um, but I think art shapes your idea. And if you never see a disabled person in society, when are you ever going to think of them when you're like building a new building for your city hall or whatever, you know, like, you need to have representation and art is representation for sure. Fantastic answer. And I guess one thing we've said many times here is we go out and train people on how to actually interact with people with disabilities because they never, they never had one day in college or one day in high school how to, how to interact with a person with a, a disability. And given the, the number of people with disabilities in our society, that's, well, that's kind of disgraceful. Um, may, I, may I ask a question about musical influences? Nobody could watch that film without enjoying the music. So what are your musical influences? Um, you know, I did a lot of Celtic music in college, and so even my original songs tend to kind of have a little Celtic flavor, um, and I grew up really influenced by Simon and Garfunkel. I don't know why, but I was totally obsessed with them. Um, in, like, seventh grade, I bought their complete works and memorized them, basically, and then later um, got into more lyrical folk from, like, the Decemberists and Wilco, and so um, lyrics are really important to me, not necessarily, like, complicated witty lyrics but the way you say things I think has to be 
a little bit different than just like common um, turns of phrase. And so I really try, like I can't get over a song if I hate its lyrics. I'm just like, no, nope, can't like it. Just can't do it. So um, that's important to me. Yeah, and then harmonies. I love harmonizing. And then when, when I got introduced to that looping pedal, Back in 2011, a friend gave me a looping pedal and it was just like mind blowing because you can harmonize with yourself. And mm -hmm. I'm, I've been a big fan, probably because Simon and Garfunkel, right? Um, the harmony has always been important to me. So um, those are kind of the biggest influences, I would say. Um, yeah, overall. Well, and may I, may I just ask, is there a website or somewhere where your music is available for purchase? Oh, yes, for sure. Um, well, and, see, you should have said that, Galen. I know, I forget. Bandcamp is probably the most artist-friendly place you can listen to and buy music. So galenlee.bandcamp.com. But I also have a website that's violinscratches.com. And that is um, kind of where you'll find everything. I do a YouTube show every single Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock right now. And I'm going to do them all the way through September of 2021. So I'm not stopping anytime soon. And I have special guests every week. And so that's youtube.com slash Galen Lee. And I can type them in the thing too, but. Um, please do, please put yeah. it in the chat. I think that, you know, I, I for one would like to check in on Sunday. Yeah, after. they're fun. They're really, they've, been, they've gotten more and more fun now that I know what I'm doing. The first few weeks, the audio is terrible, the visual is terrible and um, technical glitches galore, but it's gotten more streamlined. As you know, it's a very big learning curve this year. That's like the, the whole point of the year, right? So it is indeed. Learning. It is indeed. So I think at this time, we're going to pivot into our, our second film, you know, with Jeff yeah. and the filmmakers here. It's called Charles Curtis Blackwell. It also, you know, is certainly a very musical film. And it's, it's also really, really cool. This is like the two coolest films of our entire film festival we're featuring tonight and uh and the personalities of both both subjects galen and and charles really come through so um let's check out charles curtis blackwell and then we'll speak with the filmmakers afterwards and william you'll take some lead on those questions please following charles curtis blackwell i'm william greer um i don't know if i'm being shown right now i think it's just showing how do i get my uh i just see video. wonder woman and and a man next to wonder woman yeah that's not what i'm meaning to show in how the bottom left hand corner you should be able to click the little camera um that says start video okay there we go there you go that's better i'm yeah william greer i'm wearing a black t-shirt. I've got brown hair. You don't see the background of my room. You see me at the end of the Prickly Pear Ultra Marathon. And that's, uh, you don't want to see the background of my room right now. But um, yeah, we started this um, years ago. Um, like I said, we started the, the film festival 2004 we started the short film competition oh years after that began and we've never been able to show all of the short films that were entered into comp into the competition we only had time to show three sometimes four of them i'm glad we got to show some more this year and uh charles curtis blackwell is one of the films that i'm really glad and that we got to see it shows uh something that i think that um people otherwise wouldn't have been able to see and uh, i'm gonna start this with a question about um this this movie combines three different forms of art you've got the poetry and the music and the um drawings and the pictures and uh, that's that's an interesting way to combine different forms of art and i'm wondering with the uh 
uh, director could tell us about that. Sure. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for, for having us, William, and, and, and the team. Uh, Charles is a multi-talented artist, quite a renaissance man in the creative arts. He's also a playwright. And um, for him, it's all fluid. I mean, he, he can teach a poetry workshop. He can write a, a jazz improvised poem on the spot. He could start performing with a drummer or a trumpet player. And he's quite a painter. Um, his work is very visceral and expressive and figurative, but it has this life that uh, it moves. And I think it's relatable to people. And um, it shows his love for jazz musicians and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of imagery that has stuck with him in his life. And um, I'll say one more thing and then I'll bring it back to you. Um, I wound up making a full length documentary about Charles. It's 70 minutes called The God-Given Talent, The Creative Life of Charles Curtis Blackwell. And uh, I'm happy to say it played at a lot of film festivals, including in Greece. And um, most recently it won, it won the award for disability justice mm -hmm. at the upcoming Superfest, International Disability Film Festival that's based in San Francisco. So um, yeah, this, this short film was, was made, I had so much footage left over from the God Given Talent project that I was like, I should make a short, you know, with, with some really good scenes. And um, the God Given Talent has all like new, you know, material um, and really delves deeper into Charles's life. So um, I think I, to answer your question as well, William, is um, what's interesting about Charles is that um, we don't get into the short, it's in the feature, but he had an accident which caused his blindness um, when he was in his early 20s when he was at college. And so he kind of used his disability because when he had this accident, he talks about going totally into a shell and being inside all the time, not talking to anybody and not wanting to really have um, anything to do with the outside world. And he had an artistic background before the accident so that he was already drawing and, and particularly doing um, music. And I think what's fascinating about it is how he uses the music therapeutically really for himself first. And that's something that I think is a really fascinating aspect of his personality that even if he wants to get out there, he, you know, he's like Galen, he wants to do shows and he's getting out and doing art. And, um, but primarily for him, it was like a way to get him out of a really bad place that he was in and I think that comes through in his art and and when he speaks because he's trying to share that kind of message and experience with people. Well did um, did his art change did he change anything about his art or music after the accident after he gained a disability? It happened he was 20 when the accident happened um, he was, I think it was more, he was drawing and he said he could draw really lifelike, uh, renditions of people. And, um, and I don't think the poetry came until later, but he always appreciated music. And, um, like Aaron said, it, it definitely was part of his therapy to adjust you know, and, and continue to live his life and find ways to express himself. Yeah, I think that's something that we really wanted in terms of your question about stylistic change. Um, one of the things is he's not entirely blind. He, he gives different percentages, but like 90% blind. And so when he paints, the only way for him to see what he's doing is have his face incredibly close to the canvas and also to use really strong contrasting colors because if he's painting an orange next to a red, if he loses his, his place in the painting, he won't be able to find it again. And so it really like his disability really created this different kind of art that's incredibly colorful and really like impactful because he needs those contrasts. And so it's a really interesting, um, you know, synthesis of the disability, but also creating art that maybe he wouldn't have conceived of before because it's, it's what he had to work with after he had the accident.
And what about the musicians that play when he's reading his poetry? Does he tend to use the same one or are there different people that he collaborates with? There was a musician, Billy Tolliver, a drummer, percussionist, that he made, I think, three albums with years ago. And then after Billy passed, he started collaborating with Greer Rockette, who was the trumpet player in the film. So, um, you know, I think he feels like he's really compatible with the drums or the trumpet. Um, but he, he's usually up for, you know, to kind of experiment too in that, in that jazz spirit and the spirit of collaboration with uh, anybody musically who might, you know, he can kind of feed off their energy and find that, you know, kind of key golden thread. Yeah, there's a, there's a great scene in the, it's probably my favorite scene in the, the full film that we, we made together, um, Through God-Given Talent, that he's doing a poetry reading in downtown Berkeley, and I don't think he had any inkling that he was going to have a musician. He was just playing to do poetry, but as he entered, there was a, like a street corner performer, somebody busking, a guy named Jerry, and he talked to him for, you know, as we went in the venue, he talked to him for 30 seconds and said, like, eh, I'm going to do some poems, then, uh, you know, I'll bring you in. And in the scene in the film, he, it's just what happened. He got some audience members, you know, yell out the door, like, Jerry, Jerry, come in here. And Jerry just walks in there, just like, hey, I'm Jerry. Like, you know, we don't know each other. We just, and they play this amazing set. And Jerry's doing his, you know, kind of gets the idea of doing jazz saxophone in the back. And it's amazing because it's just that true spontaneity. And I think Charles is always, you know, always cool with that at his, his venues. If there's another artist or a musician who wants to do something together, he's just like, yeah, why not? I mean, What's, what's the downside of that? There's something really beautiful about not having everything sort of demarcated when you, when you do a performance, so. So I see that Galen has a question. Um, do y'all want to steer directly into the audience Q&A portion of the evening? All right. <laughs> and don't forget the audio description. Oh yeah. Um, thank you for reminding me. I would have definitely forgotten. My name is Galen Lee. I have um, medium length dark brown hair. It is pulled up into two little buns on either side of my head, my new COVID fashion. Um, and I have a purple flower clip on the side, on the right hand side, and black flower earrings. And I'm uh, wearing a green dress and I'm seated in an electric wheelchair in my dining room area of my studio apartment. Um, and that's my visual description. And my film is that you you really do get to focus strictly on the art, like it's almost like an art film. Um, what made you choose not to give, unless I somehow just missed it, I don't think so though, more background on Charles? Is it just because you already had this bigger film or you felt like this could be like an art, like almost, you could almost just have it on to like, learn about art you know I don't know how to explain it was less of a plot um was that intentional I assume and what's the reason I guess I think the poetry letting, letting the poetry guide it I think I feel like that's the heart of it and there's even I, I still get kind of emotional and I've seen this a million times but when he says like sometimes we we build our own prisons and put ourselves in our minds, you know, in our own prisons. Like that poem is not in the 70 minute film, The God Given Talent. And I feel like that's the heart of this short. So everything else, the, the painting comes out of the poetry. And um, I feel like, you know, he's, his talent is just endless as far as, you know, the way he can weave in and out of different form, genres and forms. So, it was exciting to kind of devote that to a 10 minute short film. And I think we've, we've made a couple other films about artists. Um, we have another one called Passion of the Money that's about the, like a, a series of elderly artists in the Bay Area and mostly in San Francisco who because of rising um, costs and rent, um, they're being forced either to leave or they're the, that last generation of artists that can survive in the city because rents are insane. And I think we, we always, because I, um, when I edited those films, I always felt like one of the things that's interesting about art films sometimes is that, you know, we're mostly talking about poets, but a lot of times 
it's like the filmmakers are afraid to show a full poem, you know? And I, I feel like Jeff and I both felt strongly that, you know, let, like, let's have a four minute poem in there, you know? Like we think poetry is beautiful, but we understand that lots of people think it's boring or it's some antiquated art form that's not as, you know, sexy as, um, you know, a song. But we felt like we want to let it breathe. Like they did a whole poem, like let's not fade them out after 30 seconds. And, and even in the short, I think we wanted to just say like, like this is the art he actually makes. Like let's show the whole art um, rather than making it all um, more narrative or the, in this case. And I'll add to one more thing. Um, I had made, I had never planned this, but my thesis film from school deals with somebody with vision impairments. Uh, it's called The Sharer from 2007. And I made it when I was in school in North Carolina. Um, and then after that, I made a film about one of the sheriff's coworkers. Um, and they both work for Industries for the Blind in North Carolina. So I think when I met Charles, it was kind of a subconscious feeling too of being drawn to, to people with some visual impairments and like who really have like a story to tell and want, and want to tell their story. Um, and that's just something that kind of has materialized through the years. All right, Galen, I think you had a question. Well, somebody just asked how you met Charles and I am curious as well in the chat. We, as Aaron said, there's a film called Passion is the Money that I started working on in the ancient year of 2015, I think it was. And the co-producer of that film, Vince Storty, he um, published Charles in his literary review. And for Passion is the Money, which is an, an ensemble portrait of San Francisco Bay Area artists and poets and musicians, Vince wanted Charles included in the film. So he introduced me to Charles and it just kind of grew from there um, with these multi projects, um, you know, crossover from Charles. Yeah, I think in that first film, when I cut that first film, Charles just really jumped out to me as somebody who, his background and his story and like everybody really noticed the multi-talented aspect of it, the fact that he, he does amazing things. I mean, he worked in prisons with, with um, people like youth of color, talking about using your art to kind of get out of those spaces that you're at. He also does youth workshops for like homeless youth in Berkeley and Oakland. And so he was just so varied of like how he uses his art. And we just thought there's so many great stories to tell. Um, and then his, you know, his own life growing up split between California and Mississippi and the different types of racism he experienced in those different places. He was involved in a busing riot at his high school in Sacramento. Um, so just kind of all, all kinds of different, you know, personal experiences that we thought would really tell a great story in a full, full length. Yeah. Um, I had a question for you, yeah. Galen. Were there any other musicians in your family before you? Um, yes, but um, my parents are both very musical. They, my mom's a choir director at their church, and my dad plays guitar, but also they had a musical dinner theater, so they did a lot of musicals while I was growing up. Um, and then I'm the only one. Well, there's like a, one of my aunts through marriage, I guess, is a really amazing violinist, and so her kids are very good, but I was the first one in my immediate family that was like, I want to do a stringed instrument and in my family right now that's doing it professionally, like on the road. Um, obviously my mom does it at the church and stuff. So, um, but I had a lot of music growing up in my family for sure. Um, that's a really big part of our culture, I guess, in our family. I've got a question from Galen. Um, yeah. Because I'm a cellist myself, I've got cerebral palsy and ADHD and all those things. But um, I'm like about to leave high school and go in and start to find my way in the world, I guess. <laughs> and I'm like starting to look into other musicians with disabilities. And I guess, have you encountered any 
Like, what kind of attitudes have you really encountered in, like, I guess, the stringed instrument world towards musicians with disabilities? Or, like, um, yourself? Yeah, I mean, the stringed world, I kind of left after high school in terms of classical music. Do you play classically? Um, yeah, a bit of classical and jazz and old types. Kind of varies. Okay. Yeah. Um, I left the, the classical world after high school. Um, partly just it wasn't as enjoyable. And I do play differently enough. Like I only use three fingers instead of the pinky. And I hold my, I have a half size bow and I hold it like a bass player. And so it's not that I couldn't learn because I played the same music as my peers, but it takes me a lot longer to learn the fingering to a classical piece. And I just didn't feel like every month learning a whole new symphony. You know what I mean? I was like, you know, that's uh, a lot. And I would rather, and I just enjoyed playing. And so I started getting into Celtic music and folk music. Um, so I'm not as in tune with the classical world. I know like um, one thing I would say, and I think this kind of applies to Charles too, actually, is like disability arts isn't something that people talk about enough or like understand. And so, yes, I don't play the same way, but that's actually why my music stands out because I play vibrato like a cello player um, and my voice is high and um, a different quality because I'm really small. You know what I mean? Like um, my music is created a certain way actually because of my disability. And so even if you do experience, because I can't say what you'll experience, um, just don't let people say, well, you can't do that. Like I, I don't know how I got lucky enough to have teachers that were willing to work with me and also like not discourage me but my senior well my high school orchestra teacher specifically was not open-minded so he would just say well I don't know what to tell you like you'll just have to figure this out and at the very last day of the school year after I had done a solo and everything he said when I saw you I thought you'd sink or you'd swim and somehow you swam which was like a big slap in the face after four years of like tons and tons of work um but I at the same time had a private lesson teacher that did hold me to high standards for what I could do, but it wasn't high standards for like, what wasn't a, like attainable for me, you know? And so I guess just keep looking, like go out and keep playing, but don't take um, discourage, like don't take people's views of you um, to heart because I think what people are missing when they do that is they actually miss out on so much art that they could be hearing or looking at um, when they preclude it because of technique or like some other reason, like, well, mostly technique. I think classical music, how many little kids get dissuaded with or without a disability because they hold their bow a certain way and then they stop making music forever because the teacher said, well, that's incorrect technique. And then they just end their musical lives right there. I just think that's the biggest shame and disability, I think is a beacon that you could kind of expose that for what it is, which is like unnecessarily limiting the world of art from different unique voices just because of something um, as arbitrary as technique, I guess. So just keep doing it basically is all I'm trying to say. I don't know what yeah. you'll experience. I, yeah, but keep doing it. Yeah. You know, that's really good. Yeah, thank you. I know I saw your tiny desk. Um, I think a couple of years before I went to this film festival and I was like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. But after I went to the film first one, I saw this whole area, I was like, and then I came and revisited your um, tiny desk and like looked into you as a person. I was like, oh my God, that's someone like me yeah. doing what I do. Um, and like, in that way, you're an inspiring person to me as like fellow musician to keep going, you know, so. Yeah, I want to see more disabled artists out there. And I know they exist, like I've been trying to find them. And I know that they do yeah. exist and I keep trying to amplify them or work with them or like, um, or at least know that they're out there. But I think um, the next generation, I'm hopeful that if we do, uh, like it's a lot more work right now to do what I do, when it, what wasn't really discussed in that music or in that, documentaries like how much harder it is to book a show when you decide you're only playing accessible venues it's a lot harder but it's an unnecessarily terrible amount of extra work that I should not have to do and if I didn't care about the next generation maybe I would say I'd rather just stay home but I do think the next generation like 
you're a lot younger than me, I assume, if you were only 14 when you were 16 when yeah. you did it. But I'm, tw I'm 36, but I would like, I would like the next generation of kids to be able to do this without all the extra crap that is attached to it right now. There's a lot of um, inequality that I think just needs to be addressed. And then hopefully you can see more and more people like yourself out in the music world. And then you can be one of them, which would be yeah. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So we have another question from Chris, and then Dennis is going to say a few words, and then we'll keep going. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm here with my wife, Janelle. I, I'm an old guy with a white beard and glasses and short brown hair, and my wife, Janelle, has red hair and a t-shirt that says Hat Show Print, which is a print shop down in Nashville, um, Nashville, Tennessee. My question, and I put it in the chat, and Gail, and you already touched on it a little bit, was how much pushback do you get? What kind of pushback have you gotten or have you gotten when you go in, when you tell people that you're not gonna play in accessible stages? And I guess, how do you find that balance between pushing and being pushy? Does that, does that make sense? Like, how, how do you find that space? Uh, that's a good question. And I recognize you. You did that essay contest. I know I did. you are. Yeah, I did. Nice to meet you in person. Nice. Well, in virtual person. Um, so um, this is Galen. And the answer to that is I set three criteria for myself before I even contact a venue. I find out if I can get in the door. Not just me. Like, this is for the audience, basically. If you can get in the door, if you can use the bathroom, and if you can get into the room where the stage is, because that's not always you know, sometimes the stage is upstairs, right? And so I don't even contact venues that don't meet those three, three criteria. And so um, I had a, for a while when I was out on the road, I had a booking assistant that would do the initial research. And if they didn't meet those three criteria, it was a no go from the beginning. And then when it comes to the stages, um, it's a little more nuanced. I, I write them and I say, you know, I don't play on inaccessible stages here's some options for you. And I send them a link um, of a ramp they can build, a really easy ADA compliant plywood ramp. I send them a link to an ADA compliant portable ramp because legally they should have a ramp, but you are technically, because I'm a temporary employee, I'm not a permanent up and not be liable. I made sure to find that out before I started giving them these links. And then, then the other thing is I say, or if you want to make a permanent solution, here's a stage lift and nobody ever, well, actually that's not true. One venue has done that option, but, and I say, if none of these are feasible, then I'm happy to play on the ground. Um, and it's your choice basically. And so I don't usually, once I know that they, that my fans can enjoy themselves, I don't try to push it to the point of like, um, maybe they don't want to keep having me at the, sh the venue, but I don't cross my own boundary of letting them lift the chair on the stage. And the thing I've been pleasantly surprised with is some venues say, well, we can't build a ramp. We have too small of a budget, so we'll have to, we'll build you. And they're really cute about it. A lot of times they'll build me a fake stage in front of the stage and like put little candles out or like make it cute. Um, or they'll just say, well, then I'm sorry, that won't work. Um, but they're not usually rude about it. But uh, more venues than not, are willing to build the ramps. Um, not every venue, and I know that I have been doing it for a while and I have had some exposure, so that might not be everybody's experience, but the reason I'm doing it is so that it hopefully becomes more commonplace, right? Mm -hmm. um, so more often than not, because if you explain, it's just plywood and two by fours. A lot of the times they're like, oh, you, but you can't bring that point up at the end. You have to bring it up at the beginning when you're talking to the venue about the show. And if they kind of know they have a choice, but I'm not going to hate them if they don't build a ramp, but then I'd really appreciate it if they do. Um, I'd say like maybe half of the venues take the time to actually build the ramp, which I think is pretty cool in the, the age we live in right now. And I just want to see that number get better and better. Um, my favorite story is a venue didn't tell me, but I couldn't get on their stage. And they they called me two weeks before the show and they said, we didn't tell you, but two months ago, we hosted a fundraiser and we raised enough money to buy an electric stage lift and we're installing it now. So it'll be ready for your show. And I like, I mean, I almost cried. It was like, yeah. that's so cool. But I mean, that, that guy understood, right? Like why this was important. And I think 
the more, so then when they do build ramps or they do a fundraiser, if I remember, which I really try to, I always thank them from the stage for taking the time to build a ramp because I do want to not only approach it from a negative aspect. Um, I don't think it's a PR stunt, like I am pretty firm, like this is really important and I won't play if I can't use the bathroom and neither can my guests, right? But but if they're willing to like make their venue accessible, I think the stage is something that I'm right now like more aiming towards positive reinforcement than like being a pain about it, right? Um, as long, but that's the whole point of like saying I won't even talk to your venue about doing a show if my, my right. friends can't get in or if they can't use the bathroom, like then it's just not really a place I want to play. And sadly that does limit you. I mean, like there's a lot of places that don't meet those three basic criteria. So 30 years after the ADA tier, but we're going to get there eventually. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. So fantastic. Uh... This is not to close. We can keep going on a little further from here. Um, I, you probably noticed that, uh, you know, we, we put this on for a month and we've uh, worked these filmmaker interviews and we're gonna do another uh, October, by the way, in October, middle October, the, uh, I think it's the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the middle weekend of October, we're gonna be doing the virtual film, book, entirely new content, the winners of the 2020 short film competition and some other stuff so i hope you can tune in then and we do all this stuff and it's always it's always free and uh but free is there is no such thing as free and how we're able to do this is we attract sponsors that uh that make this experience available and uh at this time i'd like to recognize those who really did do this for us and uh, for you as well and make these events happen. So um, I'm drawing up my list here, right? And so when we have our sponsorships for our film festival, we tend to give them titles. We don't say like copper, silver, gold. We kind of use, you know, titles that are in the, in the movie industry or the theater industry. So, um, our extra level sponsors are Austin Theater Alliance, the DentaQuest Partnership, Shield Healthcare, MCNA Dental, and Molina Healthcare. Our next level up is the supporting cast. And those folks are AstraZeneca, Amgen, Mike Shea and Tony Wilcox. By the way, somebody mentioned, I think it was you, Galen, mentioned South By. Mike Shea is a director of South By Southwest here in Austin. On the leading cast level, Linda Frost, American Construction Investigations, Upstream Technology, Pharma, Crystal Fortune Lions, LLC, the Harry S. and Isabel C. Cameron Foundation, that's a mouthful, and CDS in Texas. Coming up to another level, the director level is AbV and Humana. And our top level, the producer level, and these are the folks that really back this, not only this film festival, but back CTD to do all our work. And these guys are just great. Uh, they're all great. These folks love us more. Genentech, Heart Inner Civic, Mayor Group, the City of Austin Cultural Arts Commission, United Healthcare, and Superior Health Plan. So I, I think when I, you know, that's a pretty long list. What I would say to you folks, everyone on here, is Disability Arts has supporters out there and use them, ask them for your the support. And this is not about that people with disabilities have a harder time getting support for the arts. Artists have a hard time getting support for the arts. And let's, um, let's continue to use arts as advocacy. Now, uh, I have a little uh, prompt here that Susie has a question. So I'm gonna kick it over to Susie and pass the baton to her. 
Hey, um, my question for Jalen is, um, in, in your film, you do a good job at describing inspirational point to one of your audiences, but I wonder when you're out in the park playing, do you, do you ever get people coming up to you in the earth, taking nothing to them, and how do you handle that? That's a great question. Thank you, Susie. So how do I handle people being kind of patronizing in public, like especially when I'm playing on the lake walk, right? That's your question? Yeah. Um, so the an yeah. So the answer is a long time ago, I kind of made the realization that you can't, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, separate my disability from me, right? Like for playing, people are going to, if they have a negative, idea of disability, they are going to bring that in with them when they see me perform because I can't control what they think, right? Um, so I just try always to um, just be myself and allow them the space, hopefully, to leave with a different idea than they came in with. Um, so sometimes on the lake walk, the lake walk, that's funny that I'm glad that you brought that up because that's the one place where people feel kind of free to just share with whatever weird thoughts are on their mind. So one guy was sitting on a bench next to me once, not in this film, but in real life, like in not film life. Um, and he said something like, man, if I were you, I'd kill myself. And I was like, you know, I actually have a really awesome life. Like I travel with my music and I'm married and I just don't, I don't feel that way. And actually there's a study, which is true, that proves that people with disabilities who acquire disabilities later in life have about a year where they rate their level of happiness as crappy. But then after that year, it goes back to wherever it was. So if they hated their life before, they're still gonna hate their life. If they love their life before, they will resume loving their life. So disability itself is not a determining factor of like happiness. And I, I think ableism is and inaccessibility can be, but like having a disability doesn't inherently make you enjoy your life less. And so that's what we talked about. Um, but I feel like, I guess, um, because I could question so much, oh, do they really like me or do they just see my disability? I decided to instead just not really care about what they are thinking about the disability and because they'll have to figure it out and just keep speaking not only my truth but just making art that I'm proud of and then most people I would say 80% of people in my audiences when they come up to talk to me say that song made me cry or I really loved that one piece that you did or that was so exciting and then a few people will say you know that reminded me of my sister who passed who had a disability and that's fine and then once in a great while you'll have someone come up and be like oh that was so inspiring you know, in, and you're not sure why they use that word, um, but I try to just let people um, learn on their own, because it's not really my job to correct everybody's view of disability, but I can speak about it a lot, and hopefully they will continue to listen to the music and then discover the my TED Talk, and then they'll be like, oh, actually, my views were kind of backwards, maybe, um, or not, but I, that's a really long answer, but it's, it is a weird one because I think if you get too in your own head, you could just assume that you'll never be taken seriously as an artist. And I think that's selling yourself short because Charles's art is amazing. Um, I think I make good music and it doesn't mean that it's better than or worse than anyone else's, but I think it's good on its own. And so whatever ideas people have about disability, 
I think it would it would be a disservice to me and everybody else who really connects with it on a musical level to assume that people are seeing me differently because of my disability and somehow that is shaping my whole career. Like, I think it's a part of it, but I don't think it's, I hope that the art will speak for itself above the disability piece, um, if that makes any sense. I've never answered that question, which is why it took 20 minutes, I'm sorry. I never thought about what I would say. So thank you, Susie. Well, I asked it because that's one thing I struggle with because in my uptime from CTD, I'm a dancer. And um, I often wonder when people praise my work, if it's because of my work or mm -hmm. because I'm out there with a disability doing it. Yeah, I get what you mean. And that's, that is a tough one. I think all we can do is really try to shape culture so that people don't have to perpetuate that kind of thinking. And I would assume that there's probably some people that see your art or your work as like, this is amazing. And then some people who maybe are looking at it through their own lens, but really that's for everyone. I suppose people in different you know, of different races probably deal with similar. I mean, man, it's like you can't control how the lens that people see you with, I guess, and you just got to keep doing it. Um, yeah, it's, we live in an interesting time. Well, I've got a question um, on behalf of um, Alejandrina, who is, I think, the one person who has been on all of these Q&As. Um, she is an up and coming disability advocate here in Austin. She is totally gonna run the world one day, um, <laughs> my opinion. But she's also interested in film and using like storytelling on film as a way to blow minds, open doors, etc. And so something that she's been asking all of the filmmakers that we've had on is what advice do you have for an aspiring filmmaker with a disability or just in general? Um, and she had to get off to do another, like I'm sure world changing event, but um, she didn't want to make sure that uh, that her question got asked. So I'll, I'll pose that to, to all three of y'all. Yeah, I would say from our perspective, we consider a lot of the work um, and the exciting part about the work we do is that we're both making films and making art, but that we're also archiving something, as documentarians at least, that um, we do tend to get excited about making art, about people and things that are sort of maybe otherwise wouldn't be exposed, um, it's certainly not to this level and getting it out there. So I think as advice, it would be um, maybe seeking stories or, or write if, if she wants to do... Um, uh, like narrative films, is to seek things that are really personal and passionate to you where you feel like you can expose something that otherwise wouldn't reach the light of day. I think, I mean, it's kind of a cliche in art, but I do find it to be true is that if you try and make anything for an audience, or if you're thinking primarily about what are the people who are, you know, listening to the song or watching this film going to think, you're not really thinking about the art itself. So I think that's like a really dynamic way to, to choose what you're going to focus on. I think Jeff and I have always tried to do that with our um, with our film choices um, when we make documentaries. And I would I would add, um, you know, sometimes to collaborate, you know, helps to deepen the the exploration of the subject or the story, and um, it lets you share the success and build a team. And I think especially in these days, it's pretty unique, you know artists are able to collaborate more. Aaron and I are, are working on a project now about 
romantic love and connections. And um, we're collaborating with 17 animators all over the world. And I interviewed 21 diverse people for the project. So, um, you know, try to try to find your community and, and folks that get your vision, your idea, and that are like into your creative ideas. And because it is a lot of time. I mean, we don't really, I think most the general public doesn't realize like how much time artists dedicate to creating and um, any given project, if it's a music album, a film, a book, a sculpture, whatever it is, um, it takes a lot of time. So, you know, it has to be something you really love to do and you're going to get out of bed every day and, and be excited for it. And I mean, I don't have a lot to add to the film part, but just in general in art, I think that idea of like, I know this sounds weird, but building your audience is a little overrated. Like, I think a lot of people do their art for like 10 or 20 years before anyone starts <laughs> listening to them or looking at their work. Um, I mean, I know I played publicly for 10 years before I won the Tiny Desk. And even now, it's not like you're Beyonce when you win the Tiny Desk, like you're chugging it hardcore some of your shows still have five people because you're not like a pop star, right? And so I think it's important just to, I think you're right, like don't make it for the audience, make it because you really love it and then know that you're in it for the long haul. Um, and then I don't know, my, my filmmaker was able to do that film because he got a grant from the State Arts Board. So I don't know how you guys fund yourself, but um, it was a low budget film, but he had like he had the nice equipment, so he didn't have to hire it out. And then he, um, or maybe borrowed some of it. But all I know is he made it pretty low budget because he did most of the work. Basically, he put in like a billion hours. And uh, yeah, we go to work. we go to all our friends' houses systematically, and then when yeah. they're in the other room, we look in their couch, and <laughs> like a nickel or there's like a yep. quarter. That's yep. that's like our our main. Uh, Main way to go. I also want to say, Galen, something that you mentioned in, in when you were talking about the film at the beginning really overlaps with us. And I want to thank the organizers of this festival along these lines is that just like when you roll into a town, like you mentioned in the film, and there's, they didn't do any promotion and there's, you know, they, there's no tickets on sale. Um, yeah. we, have, we have a lot of that in the film festival world where we'll apply to festivals, get in the film festival, and like we don't even they never even tell us like when it plays or to be, we've oh. gotten notices like after the festival, like, hey, your film played last Thursday, thanks. We're just like, why did you Are tell you us? Are you serious? Oh. So it's, such a, it's a similar world where I, I think as uh, Dennis was mentioning, the filmmakers, are, the, the organizers are really hustling to make it um, work, but then maybe they forget to make some of those connections with the filmmakers. So I want to really thank this festival for doing a and A like this and really being communicative with us. Um, also to Laura for making the incredibly uh, detailed. That was like, we, we instantly said like, these guys, like this festival's on it. They're so like organized. Like we've had other ones, as we say, we just had a festival in Greece that um, we don't, you know, we, we knew so little in terms of communication. I, I bet it's the same for Gala in terms of venues that returning a call or knowing what's going on. So it's, it uh, can be tough as an artist on that, on the smaller circuit, but you guys are yeah. doing a great job. So we really appreciate it. I'll add, as an artist, you have to have a sense of humor. And yeah, you, you do. Can't, you can't take everything personally, and you're going to have to deal with different personalities. And, you know, you, you still want to have fun with it and put a good effort in. You feel like you're creating something of value and that's meaningful and that people are going to pay you fairly and exhibit you fairly for your efforts. Yeah. Any other last questions before we head out, I guess? What are you guys thinking? This has been really fun. I still have a couple questions. Um, Chris, Peggy, um, if y'all if y'all don't have any more, or any of the other organizers. Okay, I'm gonna ask one and then um, if anybody else has one, just feel free to unmute yourself um, and go ahead and ask. So as I was watching both of these films again, um, it really struck me that um, adaptation is this 
like really important theme through, you know, both of these films and the work of both Galen and Charles. And, you know, is like, that's consistent with like the disability rights movement, the independent living movement. It's like just doing what you need to do in an environment that isn't built, you know, with you in mind. And so, um, I guess that's like, you know, partly observation. Um, and then the, I guess the question comes in like, how, I guess, when you're making a short film like this to sort of talk about your lives and art, which are, I mean, I think for both subjects is like totally intertwined. Like how, how do you go about like, you know, making the decision to center adaptation and talk about that. And then how does that sort of become a theme of the film? I'm, it's not a very well phrased question, <laughs> but um, if that's something y'all could speak to, I just, would be interested to know. Yeah, I think for us, um, the Charles's story was so, like that was such an intrinsic element to it. And I think that the way that Charles lives his life has that kind of humor in it, that kind of understanding that his ability to um, go to different spaces and realize that he's going to, I mean, in, in, in his case, he has such a, a difficult, I mean, he's, he's overlapping in so many worlds as a black man who's also a poet and painter who also is blind. I mean, he's got a lot of things that he kind of runs up to um, on a day-to-day -day basis and people judging him, you know, for those three very different reasons in these kind of stereotypical ways. And I think his ability to synthesize those things and make them into a strength, and I think kind of similar to what um, Laura and some other people have said, and, and Chris mentioned before, it's like, it's that ability to realize that um, the communities that are interested in you can be something that you can build on. You know, the people like those, those um, unique characteristics that he has, or this confluence of, of things about his life can help him build people that are willing to reach out to him, whether it's, whether it's festivals, whether it's um, organizations, whether it's states, groups, um, venues, like I mentioned, working in the prisons, um, so it, it, it is like one of those kind of flip side things that there is a strength there, like Dennis mentioned, um, that, that he has. And, and I know just, I, I really appreciated Susie's question because I know Charles talks about that a lot, is that, and, and with our films, and, and I don't want to step on any toes, but it's an interesting thing that he says, like, I don't always want to be in disability film festivals, or I don't always want to be in black film festivals, you know? Um, yeah. Fortunately with our film, we did get into a number of, of other festivals, but he said like, there's that sense that like, oh, people love my paintings or they love his poetry, but then they come up to him and say the same things. Like, oh, we really appreciate what you did. We'd love to have you in our, you know, a dis like a, there was a exhibit that he did that was all, you know, disabled artists. And he was like, well, I'm a disabled artist. That's true, but I just want to be in an artist exhibition. You know, I want, that's how I want to be viewed first. And then those other things are like great little, little sort of bonuses. And um, so I think that's something that, to think of when, when you talk about adaptability as well as like finding those niches, but then also being accepted, you know, as an artist first. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add, Jeff, before I talk? Because it's the same film. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm an Italian looking man. I have curly, dark hair. I got some paintings in the back that I do. Um, you know, to cope with life, uh, a lot of painting, drawing lately, and play the harmonica as well. So I'll add that Charles, he loves to connect with people, and he understands how to connect with young people, and he understands that young people, especially today, they respond to the arts, whether it's music, writing, acting, uh, you know, visual arts, written art, written, the written word, um, he really gets that. And I think maybe because also he takes the bus and public transportation, he's like, he has kind of a sense of the pulse of regular people and he can relate and talk to like any person 
and you know find some common ground so i think for me making documentaries for like for like six over 16 years now it's just like you know i think it helps I, the one of the, i guess the last thing i'll say the advice i would give is like it helps if you make a film about somebody who wants to speak about their story and really has a lot to say i think you know you never want to be like trying to pry and 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 really you know get them to to talk like it, it's just beautiful with charles i mean he's he's willing to talk about anything and you know very honestly anecdotally he's not afraid he's never afraid to really speak about you know these like human fears and challenges and things he's overcome or things he's still struggling with so i i can to continue to admire that and be inspired by him and especially tonight i mean watching both of the films back to back it was beautiful and and very encouraging um so i hope anybody who sees this you know who you know sees it continues to work on whatever they have and, and reach their goals creatively I have, a, I have a follow up question for Galen while you're answering the previous one too, is to hear about how the film came together. As documentarian, like as an editor, I'm always interested like how that happened or what the connection was when you were Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so the adaptation question, you know, um, one thing that I think is interesting and maybe it's just me because I have a very physical disability and I've always had it, um, is I, adaptation is literally every single thing I do. Like I reach serial, off of a shelf differently. Um, I get dressed differently. I do everything differently. And so adaptation is obviously just going to be a part of a film that <laughs> is about me because that is my whole day, right? But what we decided early on is in order to make it not inspiration porn, we would leave the disability talking to that one section where I'm actually addressing an audience and saying what I feel publicly needs to be said because I think... Um, one thing disabled people, and I, 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 I don't mean this in the wrong way, but I think a lot of times disabled people are asked to like bear the hardest parts of themselves publicly a lot, like not in a film, because a film, you're signing up for that. That's like a film, you're doing it for many months and you're talking to people, but in a newspaper article, for example, or like something where other artists are not asked the same um, vulnerability kinds of questions, it's like, commonplace and so he didn't want to go down that road and so he 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 wanted to portray what i think he was more excited about was actually portraying like a healthy marriage between an able-bodied person and an you know like a disabled person and like just kind of like life as a touring artist was his primary goal but then obviously to leave that part out would not have been a service either so we decided to put it there and then um as the film came together basically mark emailed me and he's like, hey, I want to make a film about you. And I said no for a while because, again, the way media portrays disability is often horrendous. But then I, and it was actually, he emailed me before I won the Tiny Desk. And so he, I'm from Minnesota, so is he. So he has seen me or heard about me um, somehow. And so it was before I won the Tiny Desk. And then after I won the Tiny Desk, a lot of filmmakers emailed me. And I was not sure of the motives. And I was like, well, this guy... Um, like asked me before. So I watched some of his films and I thought they were really artistically done. Like I liked the visuals that he had. And um, we had a really long conversation at the beginning about like what I don't want a film to be. Um, and so we decided a good way to portray touring um, and just this kind of adventure that we were on was to have him come with us. And so um, we made it happen for a 10 day stint. Um, and it could have been a full length film for sure, because that year we literally went all over the entire country and he was maybe in like eight states with us, but we could, but I mean, it was just a budget issue where he's like, I think I can afford to make about a 10 minute film on this grant and like, and I think we could try to say, and I was surprised when I saw the finished product, like just how much he was able to put in 10 minutes. Like he, I mean, it felt like a complete thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's very good at that. So, um, but I think adaptation in the art, one thing I would like to see, not that I, I think right now, this is the saddest part for me is disability really is very far behind most 
minorities in terms of representation in our culture, right? We don't have any. And so then the problem is, is I think disabled people feel like, okay, when's my, when's my time to be in the mainstream? And we're like still kind of far from that, I hate to say. Like, I, I wish that we weren't. And I think there's starting to be some progress. But the reality is that at this point, um, I don't mind it being in like disability related festivals, but I want the art again to like speak for itself. I, but I, I don't know. I'm trying to think like, yeah, it's just, we're so far behind still that anything we can do to be in culture is good, but I would like to push it forward faster if that makes any sense. Like why isn't South by Southwest just showing films like this alongside every other film? I don't know, you know? Maybe they well, are. Maybe I'm mis. Maybe I'm misrepresenting South by Southwest. Maybe they already are. William, do you have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I've got something. I was thinking about this. I actually discovered a fair uh, uh, several feature films at South by Southwest that deal with disability. Good. And they also show some short films there. Good. And the problem is, you've got some excellent disability films there. But there's lots of other films. So the disability films are out there, but it is a small number. One year we had, I don't know, maybe eight or nine of them. That was a really big year. I'm sure you remember that, Laura. It might have been 10 or 11, which is a lot of disability films. But when you look at a festival that's going on for so long, it has hundreds of films. Um, the disability films are out there. They're getting into the um, big festivals. I also see them in uh, Sundance, but the only place where they get really prominent roles are the disability film festivals. So, you know, we've got a mix. They're in the regular film festivals, but they're not as prominent as they need to be. And I think we need to keep having them go into the regular film festivals and the disability film festivals but we just need more publicity about them yeah when they get into um the disability festival and um one of the disability films two of the disability films that we saw at south by southwest showed at the paramount theater which is a big historic theater in downtown austin one of them was excellent, one of them was horrible. And, and uh, what do you do about that at a regular film festival where they let in some really good ones and they let in some awful ones? What do you mean by awful? Like bad portrayal of disability? You're familiar with, um, um, uh, what do they call them now? State-supported living centers where people mm -hmm. with disabilities have to live and they live in really poor conditions, bad health care or no health care. There's a lot of abuse. It is a horrible, awful place to live. The bad film was about someone who got put in a state-supported living center, and it was about how wonderful this was, because oh. look at the wonderful life it gave him, and look at the relief it gave his mother. So this oh, is a no. great solution for everyone. We'll just put them in the hospitals they have to live in. And it makes a great life for everyone. So oh my gosh. That's what I mean by awful films. So they get movies like that. And the other one was about a, uh, um, I think it's Kevin Pierce, someone who was going out uh, to compete in the snowboarding in the Olympics and had a head injury while he was trying out. And it was about his recovery from that and what he's doing for head injury awareness. That's a great film, really that outstanding. That Crash Reel? The Crash Reel. Yeah, yeah. That's, one of the, that's one of the most amazing documentaries ever. If you haven't had a chance to see it, really amazing. So, her, the filmmaker's work, her work is all excellent. Oh, I just, I really love her. She's a fabulous, fabulous filmmaker. And it's, it's a bit of a, it's a hard balancing act because you get outstanding ones like the crash reel and um, the little tin men uh, played at uh, the Austin Film Festival. I don't know if you're familiar with that. 
It's about a little person who goes out for the role of the Tin Man in a fictional remake of The Wizard of Oz. And he gets cast in a different part that's like even better. So what do you do when you get some really good ones and some really bad ones in the major yeah. film festivals? And they're not the headliners. You don't get a lot of publicity about it. Well, that's the thing that bothers me is I am noticing, and maybe that's where I mean by like the frustration is, I'm noticing that there are, there is more disability representation even in like bigger conferences, but it's never the topic of the festival. It's never like the main part of the festival. It's like this tiny thing that happens at nine in the morning and four people come to it because we don't see ourselves. And that's what I wish media would start realizing is disability representation is not actually just a niche thing. Like everybody knows someone with a disability. Many people acquire disabilities. Like it's not some weird topic that you're never gonna, you're only gonna impact like this tiny audience. And so it's not really relevant to the broader scheme, which is I kind of feel like where we're at um, culturally. And so how do we change the tastemakers opinion of that and let them realize that disability touches on universal topics that apply to everyone and the art that comes out of it um, isn't despite of disability but because of it and therefore it's worthy of being showcased you know um, in the main as the main event or at least as one of the main events um, that's what I think sorry to rant you guys go ahead um uh, there was one encouraging thing I heard a couple weeks ago. I saw this um, interview from um, parents of a six-year-old who has real mom syndrome and um, Netflix has a series out. I forget the name of it, but it's not about her. I, I think it was until I looked it up, but it's actually about parents who are raising, like, a boy with superhero ability and and the the little girl is his best friend. Yeah. Well what I thought was to me is Although he not the main character, they adapted the set for her and they bought her a van that was accessible to get her to to inform the set, it is so cool. Yeah, that's Raising Dion, right? I want to see yeah. that show. Yeah. yeah. Um, apparently, when she they auditioned, she, I don't think that role was intended for a disabled character, but nope. she was just really good, and they cast her. Yeah. That's the kind of casting that I think is super neat. I want to see that show. That's so cool. In terms of the documentary world this year too, and maybe you've heard, I've been getting a lot of press, I think it's going to get an Academy Award, is Crip Camp as well, about the development of the ADA, if you've had a chance to see it. It's an amazing film, and I think 
more than anything, that has a really good chance to like break through to a wider audience. Being on Netflix, it's definitely going to win lots of international awards whenever these festivals happen. Um, and I think it's like just a like a really well told story that certainly has not been in the mainstream traditionally. So I think that could be a really good maybe um, like bulwark for you know change in the future in the in the film world at least. I agree. That film was mind uh, like very it broke some barriers getting into the main, like it was one of the top streamed films on Netflix for a while there, which I've never seen anything like that for a disability film. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and having the Obamas get behind it, like, oh. very helpful. <laughs> like, thanks Obama, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. BBC America, I think this month, is going to be showing um, some short pieces about disability. It's like fictional um, storytelling from the perspective of people with disabilities. My wife told me about it today. It's just coming to mind, and now I'm not remembering the title of the series, but... Um, there are things like that that are coming on, and I'm glad to hear that that is coming on. I'm wondering if, if that sounds familiar to anyone, something BBC America is doing with disability. Um, like I say, I just heard about it today, a couple of hours ago, and I can't remember anything more than that. I, um, I can let everyone know about it by email when I get the... Uh, information if it doesn't spark any memories with people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just, we're coming up on eight o'clock. We've been on for two hours. It's been like such a great conversation. I am fine to stick around, but I don't want anybody to feel like they have to stay because, you know, we all have our Zoom limits. Um, you have to eat dinner soon. I am right. kind of hungry. <laughs> I feel bad. I do need to go. Are I, there I, any I, last questions before okay. we're done? Or what were you going to say? I was just going to give uh, like one, one last plug before I have to go. Um, just in terms of Romantic Course, this new film um, that we have uh, about sex and romance, um, one of the elements of, the, of it is related to ability. Um, and I think that's another topic that really is like totally not in the mainstream get talked about, about like sexuality and, and people with a variety of disabilities. And so we're really excited that that's, that's part of this film that talks about kind of all different topics. So um, we did throw that, you know, our, our Instagram in the chat, if anybody wants to, to follow. Um, that, was, that was just my last little, sorry to be all buggy, but we're, we're just starting our like ad campaign for that this week. So just wanted to throw that out there. Cool. Yeah, anything with sex and, dis and disability, like, we're very interested to, like, follow and promote that. You're right, it is something that uh, we need more. Mm -hmm. We need more disability representation in general, but that topic in particular is, like, we've got a long way to go. So. Yeah, I did a TED Talk on that. Um, you can find it, Sexuality and Disability. But it's like, we just don't, especially in like media, like fun films, it's just not even a thing. Yeah, not talked about enough. Yeah. Well, on Friday, one good thing on Friday afternoon, I'm doing a panel with the Recording Academy for their online, it's part of Americana Fest, and they are including me in their overall diversity panel, which I think is really neat. Um, a lot of times accessibility gets separated from broader diversity issues. And um, I don't know why it ended up this way, but I'm one of, I'm the only disabled artist on this panel, but at least it's like part of inclusion and diversity. And I think um, I'm hoping that that is something that will get heard by some people. So we're, we are moving in the right direction. It's just not as fast as any of us would like probably. So. Thank you for including this film, and I'll tell Mark that this was awesome. So he should enter next time he does something. So. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. 
Galen, Aaron, Jeff, thank you all so, so much. Thanks for doing this. If you want to have, have us again, let us know. I'd, I'd be happy to, to uh, do this kind of event or um, be, be part of a future um, event. Thanks. Yes, thanks for Thank having you all. Really yeah, it's great. Take care. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Cinema Touching Disability thanks our CTDFF online sponsors, Amerigroup, Genentech, Heart InterCivic, Superior Health Plan, and United Healthcare. <laughs>